Amen. So keep your place there in John at chapter number 14. That's where we're going to start out um, this evening. Let me just give you the title of the sermon this evening before we even get um, started. We are going to start in John chapter 14, but we're going to go um, over to the Old Testament and look at some things there. But the title of the, um, the sermon this evening um, is kind of uh, somebody brought something to my attention, so I looked into it um, this week, and that's where this sermon is kind of coming from. I think there's some real teachable um, lessons um, in this um, conversation that I watched um, this week, and it also is very applicable to the Bible and very applicable to uh, people that don't believe the Bible and people that do believe the Bible, and just seeing the, the contrast of what people will end up believing and roads that people will go down um, if people don't have that fear of God, um, as Brother George brought up in the sermon on Sunday night. So the title of the sermon this evening, and it fits perfectly, by the way, with the last point that I was going to bring up in John 14. So I'm going to start in John 14 and make that point. But the title of the sermon this evening is Joe Rogan, Tucker Carlson, Aliens, and the Wheels of Ezekiel. All right, I know that's a long title, but I couldn't, th I couldn't shorten it up any more um, than that. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about um, this evening is um, this conversation between Tucker Carlson and Joe Rogan. And I've done a, 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 a sermon on, uh, a confounding the wise sermon on Joe Rogan before. So we know where he's at according to the word of God and his beliefs in God in general. And of course, especially Jesus Christ, I went through that. Um, but that um, became very apparent. And I want to show you, you know, kind of the results of that this evening. But let's look at John chapter 14 and kind of lay a foundation here. And then you'll see where I'm going with this. So Jesus is giving some final advice. And I went to John 15 last week and preached a sermon called Abide in the Vine. Jesus is kind of giving two main points here. When he's talking, he's giving his last um, advice to the disciples here. The first one that I went over last week was abide in the vine. Abide in the word of God. I am the vine, Jesus said. So we need to abide in Jesus Christ. That's the first thing or you know, one of the two things that he says. But he brings up something else in John chapter 14. And these um, two things are brought up in both John 14 and John 15. But I focused on John 15 last week because it gives that great analogy of the vine. And that's what I preached about. So I won't go over that again. But tonight we're looking at the second thing that Jesus brings up. And I want to lay the foundation for this sermon on this. Look at verse 16 where Jesus says this. He says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So you're supposed to abide in the vine, but Jesus says, I'm going to give someone to you to abide with you. So this is something different. Okay, then he explains. Even, now he explains what it is, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Do not miss that. Okay, so what he is saying is that whoever is saved is going to get this. And who is not saved is not going to get this. This is super key for this evening's sermon, all right? The spirit of truth is going to be with those who are saved. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. What Jesus is explaining here is that a believer gets the Holy Spirit. And I've preached on the difference between you know, being sealed by the Holy Spirit when you're saved, being a temple of the Holy Spirit, we're going to look at that in just a second, and being filled with the Spirit. All right, so those are two different things. But every believer gets the Holy Spirit. Every believer gets that down payment, that earnest of the Holy Spirit when they get saved. Now, you say, for what purpose? Look at verse number 20. In the same chapter, he even tells us what the purpose is for the Holy Spirit coming um, into abiding with the believer. Look at verse 20, I'm sorry, 26. I think it's 26. Yes, verse 26. But the comforter, but the comforter, which is, now we get the answer, right? I mean, we kind of already knew if you've read the Bible, but now he just like straight up tells you, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall, what? Look at this. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So this is the, the per, one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit. It is to teach you. It is to teach you all things. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. So as you abide in the word of God, 
the Holy Spirit will guide you in the Word of God. That's how this works. And it seems like a pretty good plan, you know, coming from God Himself. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 14. And of course, in Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible also tells us this is not a comprehensive study about all the things that the Holy Spirit does for you, but I just want to show you that mainly the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 1 seals you, which is a great you know, um, testimony of eternal security, by the way, because you are literally sealed with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 13. You know, who, can, who is stronger than God? You know, no man, you know, shall pluck them from my hand, it says in John 10, 28. But of course no man can pluck us from God's hand, even ourselves, because we're not stronger than the Holy Spirit, that which, that's what we're sealed with. That's the mechanics of it. That's how your salvation stays with you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse number 14. So the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is going to teach you as a believer. Teach me what? Well, what am I abiding in my entire life? So I'm saved and I should be abiding in the Word of God, the vine, Jesus Christ. And you know what? The Holy Spirit is going to guide me in that truth. Look at verse 14. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now, doesn't that make sense? with what we, re we just read in John chapter 14, where it says, you know, the world does not get the Spirit. So the saved person does get the Spirit. The Spirit teaches, and the Bible is literally saying that the natural man will not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So this is why, I mean, look, this is a real thing. And if you can't see this in your life with people around you, I don't know, you must not be paying attention or out in the world at all. Because it's so obvious, unsaved people will not, cannot understand the Bible. And it is, I mean, it is, everyday life will, will show you this. When people just m talk about the Bible or throw things out about the Bible, we're going to talk about this interview, and, and that came across very clear in this interview as well. But look, People out in the world that aren't saved, they have no idea what the Bible says. No clue. And the Bible's this weird book where, you know, it's the only book that people will claim to know everything about, and they've never even read it, and they know that they may have tried to read a page, and they don't understand anything that they read. But what people do is they Google stuff, right? They Google things, and they're like, oh, you know, errors in the Bible, and then now they have a talking point or something. But no idea what the Bible says. That's why, like when you see attacks on the Bible, they're like these attacks, like if you've read the Bible even one time and heard the Bible preached for any significant period of time, you, you see that like the common attacks on the Bible are like the most shallow, silly attacks like possible. You know the Bible said that you can kill your kids if they don't listen to you? Like, all the kids are like, what? Don't worry, kids. You know, I mean, like, you know, the Bible says, this is one that the, 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 the man idiots out there today say, you know, the Bible says you can have multiple wives, which they just translate into multiple girlfriends, and, like, they don't even have any idea what they're talking about. The Bible says that a man, you know, a king should not multiply wives. You know, I mean, it is, a, it is an immature person that read some story or Googled something that sees something that somebody did in the Bible as what God wanted them to do. I mean, it's like Bible 101. But look, I mean, here's the, here's the point I'm trying to make. It's the ultimate, the unsaved can't understand the Bible. It's the ultimate catch-22. Think of, have you ever thought about that? That it's like, it's the ultimate, like, situation that's, you know, you can't get out of. That, but that's why the Bible says that someone has to go to them and preach to them. You know, how shall they hear, you know, without a preacher, the Bible says. So how shall they understand? Look. But here's the irony of it, and the reason that it's the ultimate catch-22 is because the, the unsaved cannot understand the Bible, but they need to believe the Bible to be saved. Right. You're kind of like, whoa, what's that all about? Well, that's where we come in, right. where the soul winner goes and explains the gospel using the Bible to the unsaved. And then at that moment that they believe the Bible, but if you've been soul winning for any significant period of time, you, you'll know for sure that there's no way that someone will get saved. It's not like you're going to accidentally get somebody saved that doesn't believe the Bible. 
I mean, many times you'll find somebody that just gets hung up on the weirdest thing. They just get hung up on like, you know, that they're a sinner or hung up on that there's a hell or hung up on any part of the gospel. And, and you're just like, why are they hung up on this? Like, it's right here in the Bible. And then you ask them like, well, do you believe the Bible is the word of God? And they're like, well, no, not really. I mean, I think man wrote that or whatever. And you're like, oh, that's why. So somebody cannot get saved unless they believe that the Bible is God's word. But they need someone to show it to them because the natural man cannot understand it. All right? So look, that is what we have that the world does not have. I mean, we're sealed by it. It lives in us. I mean, turn, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I mean, you are literally, the Bible literally says you are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. It's where it is. It's where it stays. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 19. So everything that you do during the week, during your whole life, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit is right there with you. That's why you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, you can, you can make the Holy Spirit within you upset because the, the poor Holy Spirit is along for the ride whether you listen to him or not. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. It says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. This was, the biggest, this was the biggest advantage of the last three years right here. When there was all these mandates coming out, it's like, hey, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. But everybody else couldn't say that, could they? People that weren't saved, look, it actually paid off to be a Christian during that time. Because you could say, you know what, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which it is. Other people are just like, yeah, I don't want to. They're like, too bad. That's not protected <laughs> in, this, in this country in laws. Like, I'm not saying that's right, but your body is literally the temple. It's where the Holy Spirit dwells. And that's what Jesus is saying he's going to give us. So it makes perfect sense that as Jesus leaves, he's going to die on the cross, rise again from the dead. He's going to go and sit at the right hand of the Father but he's not going to leave us with nothing. He leaves us with his word that, we're supposed, that we have to abide in, and then he leaves us with the Holy Spirit to help us understand that word, to teach us that word. So, look, that's our advantages. That's our advantages as saved you know, believers in this world. That, that's, kind of, uh, that's, our, that's our tools. We have the Holy Spirit, and we have... The vine. These are our tools that we have, but they're only ours, and that's what you need to understand. They are only the tools of the believer. It's kind of like, what advantage hath the Jew? Well, they had the oracles of God. Well, we have the oracles of God, and we have the Holy Spirit as believers. So we have those two things. Serious advantage. All right, now, let me bring you to this conversation between Joe Rogan on his podcast. It was on Joe Rogan's podcast, and it was with Tucker Carlson. It was like three hours long. I watched the whole thing. That's really rare, but I did. And they did, went through all sorts of different things, but they talked about this, this thing that everybody is talking about today for some reason, and it's just constantly coming up, this idea of aliens, or now they're calling it UAPs, which is like unidentified uh, anomalous something. I don't I even know what the P means, but it's like some, yeah, para, paranoia or paranormal or something like that, right? So, yeah, anyway, it's, it's not UFOs anymore because, it, you know, it can't be that because anyway, but it's kind of pointing to something else when, when, they, when they talk about UAPs. But I just want to give you a couple interesting points. Flip over to Ezekiel chapter number one. Turn over to Ezekiel chapter number one. So first of all, the, the main difference here all right? Neither of these two men are saved. As a matter of fact, Tucker Carlson made some, re he called himself secular. He made some reference to being good to get to heaven in this, um, in, in this interview. It, it's clear that, I mean, obviously Joe Rogan is not saved. He like hates the idea of God. He's total evolutionist. But Tucker Carlson is, even though he kind of defines himself as secular, he believes we were created. He believes there's a God. He believes in the spiritual. He does have some fear of God there. Okay, so there is some fear of God with the Tucker Carlson and with Joe Rogan. There's absolutely none. All right, and that is why you see. So that's the first interesting point. It was very obvious 
when you look at the conclusions that both of these men come to on all sorts of different things, that not having the fear of God at all will lead you into realms of rabbit trail after rabbit trail and wasted time and wasted life. I mean, Rogan constantly goes off on, I mean, he talks about things like this AI, this AI is going to, it's going to accelerate evolution and it's going to, he loves the word sentient, which basically means self-aware or whatever. He's like, I mean, he literally believes that AI is going to become sentient or self-aware within our lifetime or our kid's lifetime. And, and then it, these computers will take over the entire human race and then they will create their own universes. These, this, this AI was going to go out and just create its own universes, and they're going to create other worlds and all this kind of stuff. I mean, wacko. <laughs> like, wacko. It's like, it's going to fold space-time, and, you know, he's just going into saying all this stuff, and, like, they can, they're just talking nonsense. And, hey, look, I did a whole sermon on AI, and you know what? One of my things that I predicted is already coming true. AI is, is simply, it's created by man, it's a computer program. What it's going to do is it's going to, my, one of the biggest things that I thought it was going to do was it was going to make it so you don't have to Google search things anymore, where it just gives you the results right there. That's already, Google's already doing that now. If you Google that, it'll just give you the AI. You don't have to click on links anymore. Look, I think that's dangerous because you can't look at the link and say, is this a good website? Is this a university? Is this a paper? What is this? It just gives you the answer, right? So look, they'll be able to control information. I'm not saying that's a good thing. All right, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but look, I, you know, it's going to take away some jobs. You know, you're going to be getting, uh, you're going to be getting your your McDonald's hamburger from Optimus from Tesla with AI in, in a few years. And that's definitely going to happen. That's coming. Okay, but it's not going to create universes, folks. We cannot create a single-celled organism on our own. We cannot create a fruit fly as human beings. We cannot make life. That is God. All right? So look, Rogan's completely off the map. And when it comes to, you know, aliens, of course, he's like, you know, there's all these other civilizations, and they're coming, and they're watching us, and all, all this stuff. And, you know, it just, it's just it's wacky stuff. It's like, it's like, you know, Stephen Hawking stuff, right? Just completely out there, complete waste of time. But Carlson, at least he's a creationist. At least he believes we were created. At least he believes that there is a God and there is a spiritual realm. Now, I've told you, hands down, that there are no aliens. I mean, they're not out there, okay? And you say, how in the world could you know that? I'm going to get there in just a second. I'm going to get there in just a second, but I first I want to go through Ezekiel. Well, I'll just tell you, first of all, I mean, I told you there's no aliens because the Bible is very clear that all the sun, moon, and stars, and the universes, it was all created for us. It was all created for our benefit. As a matter of fact, in you know, the book of Psalm, it says, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens are there for our benefit, for signs and seasons, for us, and to declare how powerful God is. So one man looks at the heavens and the, the Milky Way, and you know, if you've ever seen the Milky Way, like in the mountains at night, in the wintertime or whatever, you just one man looks at that and goes, God is super powerful. I need to fear God. And another person looks at it and they're like, oh, you know, sentient beings and aliens. This is the difference. There are no aliens. But for the evolutionist, there must be aliens. There has to be aliens. They have to find them. They're not going to. But they have to. You say, why? Because if an explosion happened and created Benjamin, that means that it is mathematically impossible that the earth is the only one out there like this. There must be others happen. Look, evolution is mathematically impossible, just like whatever. But the point is this, there's no aliens, but Carlson gives a, an alternate solution to aliens in this interview, which is interesting. Look at Ezekiel chapter one. Are you in Ezekiel chapter one? So I've told you that there are no aliens and there aren't, but look at Ezekiel chapter number one. So Ezekiel chapter number one is describing these heavenly beings, okay? Look at verse number one. We're going to go through quite a few verses here, and then I'm going to kind of try to put this together for you and explain this. I mean, it's not, like, you can't really read this and just like draw a picture of exactly what it looks like, all right? But it came to pass in the 13th year in the fourth month, 
in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. The fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, but the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, a fire enfolding itself, and the brightness was about it. And out of the midst of, there was a color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance, that they had a likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they, had four, and they four had their faces and their wings. And their wings were joined one to another, and they turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. So you have this, this being with four sets of wings, and it's got four faces. And it's important to understand uh, verse number, um, I'll, go, I'll go back to verse number nine, but just keep, keep in mind there's this being, it's bright, it's like the color of burnt brass. Verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, and on the face, the face of a lion on the right side, they had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. So there's four faces, an ox, an eagle, a lion, and a man. And I'm not going to get into that, but there's meaning there. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. The two wings of every one were joined to one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward, whither the spirit was to go. They went and turned not when they went. What that means is they moved this way, and they didn't turn and go this way. They moved this way, and remember there's four faces. They moved this way, and then they moved this way, and they moved this way, and they moved this Whatever they, they didn't turn, they just moved that way. Turn to Ezekiel chapter, actually I'll just read for you Ezekiel 10, 11. It says when they went, again this just kind of backs it up, they went on their four sides, they turned not as they went. But to the place where the head looked, they followed it, they turned not as they went. So there's four faces, one for each direction, they would just turn, turn, go. They wouldn't turn, they would just go in the direction of the different face, whatever face was facing that direction. Look at verse number 13 of Ezekiel 1. As for the lightning, likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like the burning coals of fire. So it was bright. And like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. What does that tell you in verse number 14? They're super fast. Right? They would just like went zip, 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 wherever they wanted to go, like lightning. Lightning is fast. It's like, bam, to the ground, just like that. Ezekiel 10.20 says this, The living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river Chebar, and I knew that they were the cherubims. So this is what's being described here, are the cherubims, not the seraphims. The cherubims, all right? Everyone had four faces apiece, everyone had four wings, and the likeness of the hands of the man was under their wings. Now in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 15, we get into something else. Look at verse 15. Now as I beheld the living creature, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel. And they four had one likeness, and their appearance of their work was that, as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. So this is hard for people to kind of understand, like because this isn't like a drawing, but the wheel is part of this creature, is what the Bible is saying here. All right? And they went upon their four sides, and again, what? They turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their eye, rings were full of eyes, round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. So these wheels are going with these creatures with the four faces and the four sets of wings. Look at verse number, um, look at verse number 20. Whithersoever the spirit go was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So this creature is within this wheel, is what it is basically saying. When those went, these went, and those stood, these stood, and when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. So this creature and the wheels are going together, whatever that means, okay? So Carlson, in this interview, goes off on 
you know, things that have been seen, okay? And I don't know if you've ever seen like UFO videos or whatever um, from, you know, like aircraft, you know, there, there's, they're all super grainy videos and it's like almost impossible. It's like some black blob or something. And they're like, oh, there it is or whatever, you know? But he goes off and he says that the US government has tracked these things and they move at impossible speeds. They move with movements that cannot be described by any propulsion system that is known to man, that operates in this physical world. And then he says that the US government has, and look, I don't know if this is true, all right? He says the US government has video of one, you know, going into the water, and I actually watched the video, it's super grainy, you can't even tell what's going on, but going into the water and they've tracked these things underwater at 500 knots, which is impossible for something to travel underwater at 500 knots. But look at verse number 14 again, where it says, and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now, Carlson, now again, there are no aliens. Pastor Pazarski, how do you know that? Because it doesn't match the Bible. It's simply, I don't even have to look into it because it doesn't match the Bible. The Bible tells us what the, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God in Psalm 19.1. That's what the heavens are for. They're for signs. They're for seasons. They're, they're, it's all about us. And that's what the scientists, the evolutionists, they can't stand it. So when there's evidence, whether it be the radiation, ba background radiation of the universe that points to us being in a special place in the universe, they have to get rid of that. They don't know what to do with that. We've got to find these aliens. That's why Mickey Okaku, that's all he ever talks about. It's just like alien super civilizations. It's all fake. It's just fake waste of life is what it is. But Carlson brings up that these are not aliens. And you know, one thing about Joe Rogan, one, thing, one of the reasons that I think that he's so popular is if you just watch how he has conversations with people, and it, I, I, everybody could probably learn from this, but he basically, he listens to people who he has no agreement with, and he just lets them talk. And that's one good, you know, he's a good conversationalist, in that sense because you know he's sitting there like this is out to lunch he doesn't believe in god he doesn't believe in anything spiritual he believes in evolution he believes in aliens he believes in man-made everything all right but look carlson's saying these are spiritual beings and he makes a reference to the wheels of ezekiel he's like every religion you know the wheels in ezekiel every religion has you know descriptions of these types of things and that's as deep as he got into the Bible. And we're going to get a little deeper tonight. But here, here's my answer to this. I mean, so what do we see? I mean, so what do we see? We see bright bronze, you know, shiny wheels that move like this. And they don't turn. I mean, could this be what people have seen that they think are flying saucers? Could this be? Here, here's my answer. Have there been encounters with the spiritual world? Yes, there have. Even in the Bible, there are encounters with the spiritual world. I don't know what videos are fake. I think probably the vast majority of stuff is a hoax. But is it possible that somebody saw something and there's some government secret high definition video showing some flaming wheel going down into the water at, you know, in, in whatever speeds, moving crazy like no, nothing could ever move? Is it possible that that is something spiritual? Yes, that's possible. So how can you say that? Because it matches the Bible. That's it. It matches the Bible. Spirit, the spiritual world is real. The spiritual world. Now, let me point, a big, point out a big miss even with Carlson. In Isaiah 6, it, we see the seraphims, okay? In Isaiah chapter 6. We won't turn there, but you turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. So he's not saved. So these things in the Bible that we're going to look at next, they can't be discerned by him. He doesn't understand, you know, these different things. But, you know, I mean, look, folks, if you've been soul winning, you've, you've encountered the spiritual world. I mean, there are demon-possessed people all around us. I mean, I have met so many homeless people that, that are definitely demon-possessed. 
I mean, we met one lady, the ladies met one lady one time before they even talked to her. She's like, you know, she just like, get out of here, I'm King James only too. Ah. Like, and they didn't even know, like, they didn't even said anything to this lady. The devil's King James only too. And, I mean, we, I, I've met so many homeless people that are like, I, I mean, they're just like, I knew Abraham. I knew Moses. I mean, haven't you heard people say stuff like this? Oh, they're just crazy. Okay, why would they say that, though? Why, why would a, a, some guy that I'm talking to tell me that he knew Adam? I mean, I have heard this so many times out soul winning. Crazy, weird stuff like this. I mean, people tell me they're Jesus all the time. Maybe they're just nuts. But, I mean, I, mean, I heard somebody tell me they're Jesus just last week. So... There is no reason that there would be this common denominator amongst the, the and look, the drug addicted, all these people have their, their weaknesses, they're weak, their, their guard is down, they're perfect, they're perfect targets for demon possession. And that's why you see it so much. But let me point out a big miss even with Carlson. So the seraphims, if you remember reading about the seraphims, they're six wings. And they're, you know, they're on the throne of God. No wheels mentioned, though. Just the cherubims. Just the cherubims have the wheels mentioned. Look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Look at Ezekiel chapter 28. So let me point something out here that's a little deeper than this conversation on this podcast went. But look at Isaiah chapter 28 and verse number 12. This is talking about Satan in Ezekiel chapter 28. The Bible says, Son of man, take up lamentation against the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. This is how we know that this is a, a parallel to describing Satan here. Every precious stone was in thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold. And the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Talking about Satan. Angels were created beings. Look at verse 14. Thou art the anointed what? Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Look, a lot of people call the beings in, in Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 10, Isaiah chapter 6, and other places in the Bible talking about cherubims and seraphims. A lot of people call them angels. I'd rather just call them cherubims and, and seraphims because angel's more of a broad uh, term for just a messenger of God. Somebody that God, angels take many forms in the Bible, but look, Satan was a cherubim. And yeah, I guess you, you, you could describe that as an angel, but more specifically, Satan was a cherubim. What does that look like? We'll go back to Ezekiel chapter 1. Well, I'm just saying, you don't have to go there, but it's described, the cherubim is described in Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 10, and other places in Ezekiel. So, Satan, where is he now? This is the key. This is what we need to understand. How could this be possible? Where is Satan now? Turn to Revelation chapter 12. Turn to Revelation chapter number 12. Where is Satan? And is it only Satan? Look at Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 1. And I've mentioned this before, but well, actually let's just read Revelation 12, 1, and then I'll kind of go off. Revelation 12, 1. The Bible says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with, obviously some symbolism here, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon. The dragon is Satan, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his he heads, and his tail, look at verse number four, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. This is a reference to, and the dragon stood before the woman which is ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. A reference to Jesus Christ right there. But this is explaining the war in heaven that happened after the creation. Somewhere between the creation of man and after the creation of the earth, Satan rebelled. And Revelation 12 is telling us that he took a third of the angels with him. And the Bible clearly teaches that Satan is the God of this world. 
I do not, I differ on this from some people, some of my friends. I do not believe Satan goes to heaven and back. I don't believe there's any evidence in the Bible for that. I believe Satan is the God of this world. He's here. But even if you do believe that Satan goes to heaven and back, he's the God of this world. This is where he operates. He is roaming the earth, seeking whom he may devour, devour with a third of his fellow cherubims. So what can we take from that? Turn to, and this, this, by the way, turn to Ezekiel chapter 5, just for, uh, just for sake of... This is why you see so much of God's judgment having the fraction a third in it. It's a reference to, and it's always with God's judgment. You know, it's God's judgment in uh, Revelation chapter 8, a third of the earth a third of the trees, a third of the, uh, the grass is burned up. It's, it's a reference to a third of the angels rebelling against God. Look at Ezekiel chapter 5 for another example of this. There's lots of examples of this in the Bible. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part. It's a judgment on this city. A third part in the midst of the city. When the days of the siege of the, are fulfilled, and thou shalt take a third part and smite it with a knife, and a third part shalt thou scatter in the wind, and will draw out a sword after them. And a third part of thee shall die with pestilence, and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee, and on and on and on. But I believe that this third is definitely just a reference of the third of the angels that rebelled against God right after the creation. It's significant. I mean, there's nothing in the Bible by accident. God is, there's a reason that God is doing this thing. So what's my point of all this? My point is this. With all this information and crazy things that we hear in the world today, we filter it all through the Bible. Amen. And so look, if, if there are encounters with these creatures that the Bible calls cherubims, I can tell you one thing. God has given us the Holy Spirit and he has given us the Word of God. Look, there are times when God came and you know, shown, you know, the angels to people, like, announced the birth of Christ. Like, you know, the, the, you know, the angels came, and the, the, what did it say? The shepherds in Luke chapter 2, they were sore afraid. What do you think they saw? Do you think they saw a bunch of, a bunch of dudes in, in, in long white dresses with long trumpets? Going, doo, 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 and they were sore afraid? No, they were terrified. Whatever they saw, they were terrified. I mean, they saw the, you know, it, it's quite, I don't know what they saw. I'm not going to put, you know, words in the Bible that, that God doesn't tell us, but whatever they saw was, was terrifying to them. They were sore afraid. But here's what I can tell you. For us, going forward, Jesus is very clear in John chapter 14. I'm going to be gone. Here's what you're getting. You're getting the Holy Spirit and you're getting the Word of God. You hear people, look, this spiritual stuff is real. It's not fake. This Ouija boards, palm reading, witches, it's all real. But it's not of God. It is not of God. Satan is here. With these millions or tens of millions, we just call them demons. But look, they have, they're spiritual beings, but they have some physical manifestation. They have some physical appearance that can be manifest at some time. That's what Ezekiel saw. That's why it's in the Bible. It's not of God. People that are seeing, you know, dead relatives or, you know, seances and all this stuff, I'm not saying that stuff's fake. But it's not of God. God is not sending your dead relatives back to talk to you. He gave you the Holy Spirit and he gave you the Word of God. This is how God talks to you. Amen. This is what God wants to reveal to us. This, and that's it. And then he gives us this tool, himself, God itself, manifest in us in the Holy Spirit to help us understand it. He's like, I'm not going to let you abide in something you can't understand. I'm going to help you. I'm going to teach you. So look, these spiritual beings are here. And, you know, could this be what some of that is? Maybe. It's possible. It fits the Bible. 
But now, now the question is this, what do we do with that? The answer is nothing. Nothing. Because I already knew that. I already knew that there was a spiritual world. I already knew that Satan was here with all his demons. So here's the conclusion to the conclusion. All right, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. The answer is we don't need to do anything else with that. I don't need to go and like try to infiltrate the government and try to get this video and try to figure out what this is because look, it's possible. It's possible. It fits the Bible. That could be the case. I don't know. But then he goes off and like here's another limitation of someone who's not saved. And then Carlson goes off on Alex Jones for uh, several minutes in this interview. And let me tell you something about Alex Jones. I called this 20 years ago. I, I'm not going to like pat myself on the back, but I called Alex Jones 20 years ago. 20 years ago, and I don't know if I was exactly right, but 20 years ago, I'm like, you know what? This guy's this guy a salesman. He's playing a part. That's what I said 20 years ago. Now, I think that it might be where, okay, he's a, he's a salesman playing a part, and maybe he's a little unbalanced. Maybe, maybe two of those things mixed together, all right? But Tucker Carlson goes off, and he, you know, Alex Jones has called some things right. He's called some things right. He's called a lot of things wrong, but he's called some things right, some pretty dramatic things, like, Four months before 9-11, they're going to fly planes into those buildings and they're going to blame it on Osama bin Laden. It's on video. And Tucker Carlson is like, he's getting spiritual revelation. And I'm just like, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Look, Alex Jones, at some times, it seems, I don't know if you've seen, I, I don't watch a lot of him, but I've seen um, several clips of his over the years where it seems like he is possessed. Like, he is, he is, he seems like he's possessed. Let me just say that. It seems that way. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 20. So the Bible here is telling us in Deuteronomy 18, 20, it's like, hey, there's all these people that are going to be out there claiming they're prophets of God. But the Bible tells us there is a very clear way to tell if somebody is a prophet of God or not. Look at Deuteronomy 18, verse number 20. It says, but the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. So that's what God thinks about a false prophet. But then, I mean, the question is, well, how do I know which prophet's right and which prophet isn't? And if thou say in thy heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Look, God's not speaking to me audibly. So how are you supposed to know if what somebody says is from God or not? Look at verse 22. Well, when a prophet speaketh, in, well, I mean, there's another way that we can tell too, but look at this one. If a prophet speak into the name of the Lord, and the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet which hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Why? Because he's the false prophet of verse number 20. That's why. And he should be put to death. So the Bible is saying, that the Bible is saying, even before we had this, the Bible is saying, if somebody comes out and says, hey, God said this, and that thing doesn't happen, they go out and they make a prediction, and it doesn't come to pass. Like somebody predicts Jesus coming back multiple times, and it does not happen, Jehovah's Witnesses. That is not a prophet of God. I mean, it's not that hard. And, but guess what? We also have the Bible. So we know if somebody speaks something that is contradictory to the Bible, that that is not a prophet of God. That's why I have you turn to all the verses. Like, turn to this verse, turn to this verse, turn to this verse. So you can see it too. So we're all looking at the same word of God. Now look, Alex Jones is not a prophet, and I don't know that he's even claimed to be a prophet. But Carlson is claiming for him that he's getting spiritual revelation. But I can tell you this, I don't think so. But if he is getting spiritual revelation, here's what I can say. It's not from God. It is not from God. Because God's not going to go and give somebody 60% wrong answers and 40% right answers. That's not how God... God is truth. All the time. I mean, so look, he, he's called some things that are correct, but he's called a lot that's not. Clearly not a prophet of God. Like I said, I, I don't want to beat up on the guy because I, I don't think he's claimed to be a prophet of God. 
But here's the kind of the point of the sermon tonight. Here's kind of the point of the sermon tonight. I just want you to be able to discern things through the filter of the Bible. So you can discern things. It was really cool to see these two men. One had a fear of God. One had no fear of God. And just see their conclusions how, okay, maybe. Or completely out of this 12th dimension or whatever you want to call it. Just completely left the building. And it was really neat to see that contrast. But then it shows you how, as we know the Bible, it shows you how even somebody that has a slight fear of God just still has no idea what the Word of God says. It's a great proof. It was a great proof of the Bible, of the Holy Spirit to us. Look, some people, I mean, look, folks, some people, they just, they, could, they cannot handle the Internet today. And we talked about this a little bit on Sunday night, but I mean, there's all, I mean, it's just conspiracy after conspiracy and deep, dark secret after deep, dark secret. I mean, the best example I can think of this is like, just like Building 7. Building 7 of the World Trade Center Tower. I mean, how many people think that that collapsed on its own because of the two towers? I mean, how many people think that? How many people think that it was, it was demoed or whatever? The point is this. I could spend my whole, you could, sp you could, watch, you could watch tens of thousands of hours of video on this. I could spend my entire next five years of my life researching this. And I could look into it, and I could, you know, I could, I could, I could hack the government and find out what really, I mean, no, I'm just kidding. But I mean, I could spend my entire time researching Building 7. And then, what if, because guess what? I could find you people that say that it, it fell down naturally, and I can find you people that are smart engineers on both sides that say it was, it was demolished or, you know, demoed or whatever. But if I spent the next, if say I spent 10,000 hours trying to figure out what the truth was, and then I found out that the government really demoed the building, what did I gain? The answer is nothing, because I, think, I don't think the government is trustworthy. And I didn't think that when I started the whole process. Like, ooh, the government lied. Waste of time. Waste of time. And you'll never know. You'll never know the depths of the truth of those things. So you are literally just wasting your time going down these rabbit holes that Alex Jones is happy to sell you. And that's exactly what he's doing. So look, I mean, spiritual beings, sure, it's possible. It's an explanation. I mean, number one, I've, I've always said, like, you know, it's, it's either hoaxes State technology, I kind of doubt this one that it's like state technology because I think if the United States had technology like that, we probably wouldn't be losing a war to Russia that has better technology than us. <laughs> but, you know, that's just, I don't think so. I, I think a lot of these, these conspiracies about, oh, there's, some, there's a carburetor out, out there that gets 300 gallons to the, to the miles to the gallon and it runs on, on uh, you know, Gatorade or whatever. I mean, those things are not true. Those things are fake. And I know that just because of my technical background. But it's, it's, it's an explanation that matches the Bible. It might be a, a good explanation. Maybe the best explanation. Maybe not a bad explanation. I don't know. But the, as, far as, it's as far as I need to go is what I'm saying. I'm not going to be spending a lot of time like, researching this. Because whatever. I mean, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And then he kind of goes into like conspiracy theories like, yeah, you know, and we think the government might be in league with these beings or whatever. And I'm just like, again, you know, probably not. But, you know, you look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12. Say, you know, that we all get to heaven. And it turns out the government knew about the cherry bims and that's what they were. And they were, had a secret deal with Satan or whatever. It's like, would that surprise me? Well, not really. Look at verse, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12. It says we wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the what? The darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So are there wicked things going on above our heads that we'll never know about until we get to heaven? Yes. Does that surprise me? No. I mean, does it, does it wreck my day every single day? No. 
Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 14. So look, we filter things through the Bible. And again, some people should just, you know, you, end up, you know a question was asked the, uh, the other night, like, how do people end up like these flat earthers and all this kind of stuff? It's because some people just can't filter things. They just have no filter. So every piece of garbage that comes into their brain, they just accept. And they're like, oh, government bad, so government tell me earth round bad or whatever, you know? I mean, it's just like, yeah, you know, there's always truth with lies, though. And, you know, some people, like, should just stay off the Internet it is the answer to that question that I was asked. Like, if you're the kind of person that just, that just gets hooked on these things and just can't stop looking into things that are just a complete waste of your time, you know the government's bad. You know there's spiritual wickedness in high places. You know there's chariot bims. You know Satan's here. You know, you know there's this entire spiritual realm that is around us that, thank God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, protects us from. And all we need to know is that we need to abide in the vine, abide in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit will help us decipher, you know, this, this great mystery to the rest of the world and go out and preach the gospel and focus on our families and raising our children. I just think, like, how much time people spend on this stuff and, like, where are their kids? Where are their kids when they're watching all this stuff? Where are their, I mean, just all of these conspiracies and, like, I mean, they're... There is just everything out there. But everything has to be filtered through the Bible is the main thing. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 14. The Bible says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to just get carried away with every silly thing that's out there. And I'm not talking about if you watch the interview. That's not what I'm talking about. It actually wasn't bad. I mean, there wasn't um, any, it wasn't, I'm not saying go waste your time on it, but I, I did watch it. But I'm not saying like, you know, that. But I'm just saying like looking into all these conspiracies and letting them consume your life is not a good thing to do. And some people, if they get carried away with all these things, they should stay away from all of it. They should just shut the computer off and go plant a garden or something. Go do something. Go live your actual life, you know. But we're supposed to be speaking the truth in love. And look, this stuff can really, it can really take you over, you know. I mean, if you look at Alex Jones, I mean, the guy's, it's probably ruined his life, I think. I don't know. You know, just getting into all this stuff and, and just, it, it's made him kind of crazy, I think. And that's, that can have that effect on people. But that shouldn't be us, right? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.